Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're continuing with our ongoing series entitled The QME's Financial Impact. And this is the third video in this series so far. And in this series, we're talking about how the qualified medical evaluators' opinions and conclusions in their QME report impact, number one, the examinee's financial condition. And we're talking about how the QME's opinions and conclusions impact the financial condition of the workers' compensation system as a whole in the state of California. And it's been a fascinating process uh, to research these topics. In today's discussion, I want to talk to you about how your opinion and conclusion, either for or against industrial injury, in other words, we're talking about your AOE, COE determination. I want to talk to you about how your AOE, COE determination impacts the workers' compensation system as a whole throughout the entirety of the state of California. Now, many times we get these cases where in an opinion either for or against industrial injury is required. In other words, that's the main purpose of the evaluation. And it's at this point that the QME's opinion has to, has to, has to be accurate. Because if the QME opines incorrectly, someone is going to get screwed. <laughs> Either the examinee who qualifies and deserves workers' compensation benefits will be denied those benefits when they actually qualify for those benefits. None of us wants that. Or the other scenario at the other end of the spectrum is that the QME opines incorrectly for industrial injury when the examinee does not actually qualify for workers' compensation benefits in which case the employer, in other words, the insurance carrier, the payer, the employer, the employer gets screwed and none of us wants that. I don't know about you, but I myself am an employer. <laughs> I have employees, I pay workers' compensation premiums, and I certainly don't want any of my employees to be receiving workers' compensation benefits that they don't qualify for, that they don't deserve. So the uh, opinion and conclusion on AOE, COE is critical. It's critical. It has to, has to, has to be correct all the time. Now, the AOE, COE determination, doctors tell me, is the most difficult decision that they ever have to make. And so I want to spend uh, some time talking about how to make the AOE COE determination and how to make certain that your conclusion on your opinion either for or against industrial injury is accurate, is true, it's actual. In other words, if you could have a crystal ball and you could correctly opine 100% of the time, that would be the ideal and perfect case scenario. Well, because we don't have crystal balls, we need to have a system and a checklist and an algorithm to arrive at a correct conclusion either for or against industrial injury. In other words, this is not something that can be uh, processed in a cavalier manner by the qualified medical evaluator because of the gravity of the situation. It's important that the correct determination be made in every single case so that examinees who deserve and qualify for workers' compensation benefits can get those benefits. And in cases where the uh, examinee does not qualify for workers' compensation benefits, then that particular examinee is blocked or prevented from receiving benefits that they don't qualify for. So in today's discussion, I have many, many materials to share with you. And we're going to begin by reviewing some of the statistics that we've discussed in our past two sessions as those statistics relate to your AOE, COE determination. And then I'm going to share with you uh, some references from the AMA guides. I have some references uh, from uh, a recently published uh, textbook on uh, symptom magnification and malingering. And then uh, I want to conclude uh, probably in session number two 
related to AOE COE session number two. In other words, it's going to take us two sessions to fully handle causation and your AOE COE determination. In session two, I want to talk to you about how to uh, obtain the truth from your examinee in the face-to-face -face interview in those cases where your AOE COE determination is requested by the parties. And then finally, finally, I want to give you a fascinating insight into AOE and COE. And as you know, as qualified medical evaluators, we don't opine on COE. We limit our opinion in these difficult determinations to the AOE, the arising out of employment determination. And many qualified medical evaluators uh, provide an improper assessment by focusing on the COE, which is outside of the realm of the QME's expertise. The COE determination is performed by the judge, by the trier of fact in the case. And many well-intentioned qualified medical evaluators provide their best opinion, their most well-reasoned opinion, that does not become accepted by the judge because the opinion is focused on the COE aspect and the COE facts versus the AOE facts. And I'm going to share with you uh, your precise role in putting together your causation argument in the body of your report by focusing on the AOE aspects of the claim. So I have a fascinating uh, discussion for you here today. And uh, our discussion includes uh, several materials that I've included as downloadable links uh, in today's blog. So I'm going to give you a minute to go ahead and assemble, assemble those links and assemble those materials and I'll retrieve the materials as well. And I look forward to being right back here with you today uh, in just a few moments as we continue our ongoing discussion entitled The QME's Financial Impact. And today we're talking about the AOE COE determination and how to make a correct determination 99% of the time. So I'll be back with you here in just a very few moments. Okay, I'm back with you now and uh, have my references uh, for today's discussion here. I hope you uh, have taken a moment to assemble your materials as well so that you can lay your own eyeballs on some of these references uh, that we'll be discussing today. So I have for you here today a couple of books that we'll get into and also uh, some notes. And uh, we're just going to zip right through today's topics because uh, I have a lot of material that I want to share with you. Now remember, in our first two sessions, uh, we spent great time talking about some recent studies and statistics related to the California workers' compensation system. In our first session, we talked about this uh, WCIRB 2017 uh, study from the Workers' Compensation Insurance Rating Bureau, and we'll make a few references to that study today. In our second session, uh, we spent great time talking about the recent RAND study about provider fraud, medical provider fraud, in the California workers' compensation system. And we focused our discussion on one of the chapters within this study. It was uh, chapter four, entitled Bringing Post-Employment Claims Back into the System. And we'll make a couple of references uh, to this study in today's discussion as well. So as we continue with this ongoing series, uh, we're going to be getting into uh, the QME's financial impact in the big money decisions that we handle in each and every case. And that has to do with your opinions and conclusions on causation, your opinions and conclusions on permanent impairment, your opinions and conclusions on, on apportionment. And then finally, in our last session of this program, <laughs> I'm going to give you a fascinating in insight as to how the QME's payment 
for his medical legal services, in other words, for his evaluation report, how the QME's payment influences his opinions and conclusions in his report. And uh, you might find this to be uh, quite a interesting and con quite a controversial topic. And you might be quite surprised to actually hear someone like me admit <laughs> that the QME's payment for his report has a direct bearing on the QME's opinions and conclusions within the body of that report. And uh, I'm gonna share with you uh, just how that has become especially important in the modern era that we're in right now, where QME payments are undergoing uh, sharp scrutiny by the Division of Workers' Compensation and where QMEs are receiving um, massive pay cuts for the important work that they're doing. And this is affecting the QME's opinions and conclusions in the reports. And I'm gonna share with you uh, several case studies, several case examples uh, to illustrate those principles. But for today's discussion, we're focusing on the AOE COE determination. So I want to reiterate some of the statistics from those two studies that we referenced as those stati statistics relate to causation and your AOE, COE determination, okay? So to begin, uh, just a few statistics from the WCIRB study that relate to causation. And the first one has to do with employer Costs. Now, most of you doctors listening to this program are employers. I'm an employer, and you're probably an employer as well. Well, according to the WCIRB, uh, California continues to have the highest premium rates in the country, the highest rates for workers' compensation coverage for your employees. We're the highest in the country. We're in last place, number 50. Out of 50 states, California has the highest premium rates in the country. <laughs> and this is due to several things. Number one, the high frequency of permanent disability claims. Number two, the high medical costs per claim. Number three, a more prolonged pattern of medical treatments per claim. And number four, much higher than average costs of handling claims and delivering benefits. So let me ask you, if California has a high frequency of permanent disability claims, is it possible that even one single person, one single examinee, one single claimant, one single employee who received a permanent disability award in California is it possible that even one of those employees did not suffer an industrial injury and that one single employee was admitted into the system in error due to an opinion by a qualified medical evaluator or an opinion by a primary treating physician for FOR, industrial injury? In other words, is it possible that even one single person should not have received a permanent disability award because they should not have been admitted into the system because they did not qualify for workers' compensation benefits. I'm sure you'll agree with me that mm, there's probably one in there that did not qualify for workers' compensation benefits. And if there's probably one, is there probably more than one this is where your opinion for or against industrial injury, your AOE-COE determination, is critical because an improper decision on AOE-COE continues to drive up costs for us as employers. The high medical costs per claim. Is it possible that there's a single examinee in the system receiving medical treatment for a condition that was not caused arising out of and in the course of their employment, of course it's possible. Not only is it possible, it's probable. Not only is it probable that one single examinee, I'm sure you'll agree with me that probably there is many, many, many hundreds and thousands of examinees currently receiving medical treatment under workers' compensation for conditions that did not arise out of or occur in the course of employment. <laughs> 
So your AOE, COE determination is critical. Let's talk about uh, how monies are paid out in California workers' compensation. It seems that uh, temporary disability and permanent partial disability benefits comprise over 90% of indemnity benefits, with temporary disability benefits totaling approximately $1.6 billion per year and permanent disability benefits approximately $1.4 billion per year. Is it possible that one single examinee is receiving temporary disability benefits when they don't actually qualify for benefits under workers' compensation? I'm sure you'll agree with me that there must be one. If there's one, are there two? Are there 10? Are there 20? Are there hundreds and are there thousands of examinees in California receiving benefits under workers' compensation? In other words, they've received a opinion for FOR, AOECOE, and have been admitted into the system and are now receiving benefits because of a QME's determination, a QME's incorrect determination for industrial injury. I'm sure you'll agree with me that if there's one, there's probably many, many more contributing to these high and unnecessary costs. Further, payments made directly to injured workers, which are primarily for future medical care services, have increased due largely to the acceleration in claim settlement rates. Let me ask you, do you think there's one single examinee receiving a settlement award for future medical care as part of their compromise and release settlement for treatment to cure and relieve the effects of a condition not arising out of or occurring in the course of employment? I'm sure you'll agree with me that there's at least one. And if there's one, is it possible that there are hundreds? I'm sure you'll agree that there are possibly hundreds of people and thousands of people receiving settlements under their compromise and release for future medical care that did not qualify for benefits even in the first place. Again, emphasizing the importance of the AOE and COE determination. Finally, California has by far the highest permanent partial disability claim frequency in the country. It seems in California, no one gets well. <laughs> no one gets well, due, even with time and even with medical treatment, they fail to recover to a pre-injury condition and go on to receive a permanent impairment rating and a permanent disability uh, award. Is it possible that one single person who receives a permanent disability award is receiving that award in error? They're receiving that award in error because they did not suffer an industrial injury arising out of and occurring in the course of employment? I'm sure you'll agree with me that there might be one. If you'll agree with me that there might be one, is it possible that there's 10? Is it possible that there are 100? Is it possible that there are thousands and thousands of injured workers receiving permanent disability awards in the state of California that do not qualify under workers' compensation for those benefits? because they did not actually suffer an injury arising out of and occurring in the course of their employment? I'm sure you'll agree with me that it's possible. <laughs> and thus the AOA COE determination is a critical determination. You have to have to get it right every single time. Now we certainly want examinees who do suffer injury, AOE COE, we do want them to get their benefits. However, for examinees who do not qualify for those benefits, it's important that we restrict those benefits to examinees who truly qualify for those benefits and that we do not deliver unnecessary benefits continuing to drive up the costs for employers in the state of California. Now, 
referencing now the RAND study, a couple more statistics as relates to the AOE, COE determination. And this has to do with the number of examinees that we're seeing for whom an AOE, COE determination is necessary. This relates to those cases that involve denied cases that then come to us under Labor Code 4060 for the compensability exam. It seems that uh, there's a growing number of examinees, especially in Southern California, filing claims for post-employment cumulative trauma injury. And in a knee-jerk reflex, it seems that claims administrators, their initial response to these claims is to deny these claims. That's why we get these claims under Labor Code 4060 because they're a denied claim and the examinee qualifies for a QME evaluation under Labor Code 4060. Well, when the claim is denied, the examinee quickly receives medical treatment outside of the medical provider network with medical providers willing to provide medical treatment on a lean basis. And the RAND study addresses this particular circumstance in the workers' compensation system. These medical providers that accept treatment on a lean basis for these denied claims file liens to recover their, to recover payment for their services. So according to the RAND study, liens filed each month with the WCAB have more than doubled in less than two years and are holding at 30,000 liens per month. 30,000 liens per month. Now, I'm coming to you from the Sacramento area. And in the Sacramento area, we have a stadium called Arco Arena. I think it's now Sleep Train Arena. Sleep Train Arena holds approximately 21,000 people. It's a huge arena. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we're having more people filing liens per month than can be handled or accommodated even at Sleep Train Arena. It's approximately 30,000 per month. And uh, these relates to the post-employment cumulative trauma claims. Now, according to the RAND study, many of these claimants represent fraudulent claims, fraudulent claims. So if these claimants, these examinees, present for a qualified medical evaluation, if these are representing fraudulent claims, what is the chance that the claimant who presents for the qualified medical evaluation is going to exaggerate their claim? is going to exaggerate their injury, is going to tell half-truths about the cause of their injury. Would you agree with me that it's possible? Would you agree with me that even one single examinee could come to the qualified medical evaluation and attempt to convince the examiner that they're suffering from a condition that arose out of and occurred in the course of their employment? Is it possible that even one of those 30,000 could attempt to do that? I'm sure you'll agree with me that that's possible. I'm sure you'll probably agree with me that the number is even greater than one. <laughs> it's probably hundreds and thousands of examinees out of the 30,000 per month who are seeking treatment for medical services outside the medical provider network are going to come to the qualified medical evaluation and attempt to convince the qualified medical evaluator to opine for FOR, AOE, COE. Well, the RAND study addresses that with the following quotes, and I want to read these exactly to you to set the stage for what we want to discuss in the remainder uh, of today's program. They say, this is a quote, one would assume that healthcare providers who are taking treatment on a lean basis 
continually facing losing about 90% of the asserted value of their services by offering to front the cost of care for their patients would cease their laudable generosity at some point. But the flow of liens seems to continue unabated. So these medical providers apparently are settling their liens for approximately 10% of the value of the liens. So they're losing 90% of the value of the liens. And yet the process seems to continue unabated because apparently 10% of the value of the lien seems to be profitable for the medical providers. They state that these facts give rise to the suspicion that the high dollar liens that certain providers in certain regions generate might not accurately reflect services actually rendered <laughs> and were filed primarily for the purpose of forcing the insurer to settle for what appears to be mere nuisance value, but instead could be a significant source of profit. In other words, there's reason to believe that the frequency and severity of CT claims in Southern California are being largely driven by intentionally fraudulent acts rather than genuine instances of appropriate medical treatment for industrially caused cumulative trauma, which was first discovered post-employment. Conclusion, a substantial number of post-employment claims are being advanced solely for the opportunity to run up inflated lien totals and not with any expectation that the entire case in chief will be resolved in the applicant's favor. So let's think about this for a minute. If there's approximately 30,000 of these liens being filed monthly, that is not a trickle. That is not a small flow. That is a gushing geyser. That is a pipeline. 30,000 liens filed per month. These are examinees who are gonna come to us under Labor Code 4060 for the compensability evaluation because the claims administrator initially denies these claims. Now, if it's the conclusion of the RAND study that these cases are being filed, or these cases are being generated for the purpose of running up liens, what does that mean for the examinee? What is the intention of the examinee? What is the role of the examinee? It appears that the role of the examinee is to simply participate in medical care for the purpose of generating large liens. So these examinees are going to come to us for an AOE, COE determination under Labor Code 4060. Now, it's critical that the AOE, COE determination, therefore, be correct because some of these cases, a small percentage of these cases, are going to reflect people who actually qualify for benefits. But according to the RAND study, a substantial number of these, and they don't tell us what percentage, but they say a substantial number of these are being largely driven by intentionally fraudulent acts. And for these intentionally fraudulent acts or these intentionally fraudulent claimants, these are claimants that need to receive a no opinion regarding AOE, COE. The opinion needs to be against industrial injury in those cases that are being driven by fraudulent acts. Well, I know these are sensitive topics and we don't want to be uh, seemed to be doomsayers and doom and gloom uh, prophets here, but is it possible that examinees in workers' compensation system uh, could be involved in fraudulent acts and could intentionally malinger their condition for the purpose of receiving workers' compensation benefits? Is that possible? Well, it seems that the AMA guides have something to say about that. And let's uh, just take a look at what the AMA guides tells us about this particular situation. 
Now it's quite interesting, uh, if you have your AMA guides, you might want to look at this section uh, in the book. In the very last section of the very last chapter of the book, in other words, right before the conclusion of the book, <laughs> here's the conclusion in chapter 18. Section 18.8 is the conclusion of chapter 18, which is the last chapter in the book. Well, right before that, in a tiny, tiny section, section 18.7, it's entitled Malingering. And it's sort of as if the AMA guides tell us here in this section, they tell us, uh, oh, uh, by the way, <laughs> now that you know everything about permanent impairment ratings and conducting permanent impairment evaluations, through 18 chapters. Now that you know all of that, there's just one little thing that we should tell you. <laughs> and here in the last section of the AMA guides, they give us some references which are cited in the reference section of chapter 18 about the numbers of examinees in compensation claims, like workers' compensation claims, about the number of examinees who may not be entirely forthcoming about the cause or the extent of their condition. And I want to share with you some of those references. So the first reference from uh, chapter 18 of the AMA guides is a study by uh, Fishbane. Fishbane is entitled Chronic Pain Disability Exaggeration, Malingering, and Submaximal Effort Research. Chronic Pain Disability Exaggeration. The conclusion of this study is that malingering may be present in 1 to 10.4% of chronic pain patients. 1 to 10%. So perhaps as many as 10% of chronic pain patients may malinger their condition. Well, is it possible if 30,000 liens are being filed on a monthly basis, largely due to intentionally fraudulent acts, which is the words of the RAND study, it's not my words, it's the words of the RAND study, is it possible that that number could be even higher? I suspect that it's possibly even higher. Thus, the importance of a proper opinion on AOE and COE. The next study... This is referenced in chapter 18 of the AMA guides. This is entitled, fascinating study, it's entitled Cortical Evoked Response Audiometry, Audiometry, Hearing Testing, in Noise-Induced Hearing Loss Claims. In uh, Canada, it seems that there's a, a high incidence of workers' compensation claims for hearing loss hearing loss due to noisy environments, people that work in factories, people that work in airports. And it seems that people claiming hearing loss are prone to exaggerate the extent of their hearing loss <laughs> for the purpose of receiving workers' compensation benefits. So here's, what, here's what, how they conducted this study. They used a subjective hearing test where they put noise uh, tone pulses into the ear. And they asked the examinee to give a thumbs up for when they hear the tone and to do nothing when they don't hear the tone. So in these claimants, uh, filing claims for hearing loss, they administered the tones. And the claimant did not respond. <laughs> And they put the tone in the ear, and there was no response. And they changed the tone, and there was no response. And they changed the frequency of the tone, and the claimant just sat there, subjectively stating that they did not hear the tone pulses. <laughs> so the claimant did not respond that they heard the tone pulses. Well... With an objective test, a more objective test, known as cortical evoked response audiometry, 
which is a test which measures the electrical impulse in the impulse arriving at the auditory cortex in the occipital lobe of the brain, the objective test showed that the response was received, that the tone was received in the auditory cortex of the brain, indicating that the hearing assembly, meaning the external ear, the, uh, the inner ear, the cochlea, the cochlear nerve, the relays all the way back to the auditory cortex were completely intact, <laughs> indicating that the examinee actually heard the noise. It was an objective test. So in comparing the results of the subjective test with the results of the objective test, they found that the incidence of exaggerated hearing loss was 17.7%. Testers performing the first subjective hearing test detected only 2.2% of claimants who exaggerated. The audiologist performing the second objective test, the cortical evoked response audiometry, detected 94.2% of claimants <coughs> who exaggerated. They concluded that the high incidence of exaggerated hearing loss and the large difference in the ability to detect this exaggeration demonstrate the need for appropriate test procedures to be followed and a second objective hearing test to be introduced. Without accurate testing, there will be overpayment for noise-induced hearing loss claims as many as 17.7%. So the first study was as high as 10% of malingering or exaggeration. This test indicates as many as 17.7% of exaggerated and malingering for noise-induced hearing loss claims. Now, let me ask you, is it possible that the frequency of exaggeration and malingering could be even higher especially when we know that as many as 30,000 liens are being filed on a monthly basis for what the RAND study describes as intentionally fraudulent acts. Is it possible that this background rate of 17.7% is actually higher here in California? It's my suspicion that it is. And therefore, the AOE-COE determination is critical. It's critical. And we're going to talk more about how to make your AOE COE determination in our next session. So that's this study, Cortical Evoked Response Audiometry. Crazy claimants uh, pretending that they don't hear the toned pulses when objective testing indicates that they actually are hearing the toned pulses. This next study. Uh, also described in chapter 18 of the AMA guides is fascinating. This is going to blow your mind. The title of this study is uh, The Prevalence of Surreptitious Laxative Abuse. Surreptitious means uh, secret and concealed. Prevalence of secret and concealed laxative abuse in patients with diarrhea of uncertain origin. So imagine this. A patient shows up to a university medical center in the gastroenterology department complaining of diarrhea, <laughs> okay? And the doctor, uh, in performing an adequate history, asks several questions, including, have you used or do you use laxatives. <laughs> and imagine an examinee who says, nope, I don't use laxatives and I haven't used laxatives. When stool samples, fecal samples of these examinees demonstrate the presence of laxatives. <laughs> and so the doctor continues with his questioning and he asks the examinee, what do you think is causing the diarrhea? And the examinee says, I don't know. And they explore dietary causes and they explore infectious causes 
And the examinee continues with answers such as, I don't know, that's why I'm here, I need evaluation for my diarrhea, when all the while they're suffering with diarrhea, which is self-induced because they're taking surreptitiously, they're taking laxatives. Now, this is a fascinating concept because it brings up a new topic, which we're going to get into uh, here shortly, referred to as false imputation. So these are examinees. These are claimants that have a bona fide condition. They have laxative. Uh, they have diarrhea. There's no dispute that they have diarrhea. They have a bona fide condition. But they're not admitting the true cause of their condition. They're imputing the cause of the condition to something other than their surreptitious laxative abuse. And we'll talk a little bit more about false imputation because we're going to encounter false imputation over and over and over again, especially with the high prevalence of fraudulent claims. We're going to be seeing examinees that truly have true and bona fide medical conditions, but the false imputation is that those medical conditions are not related to the workplace activities. So the conclusion of this study is that we found that 15% of patients seeking medical help for diarrhea in a university hospital gastroenterology clinic ingest laxatives, even though they deny doing so. The prevalence may be even higher as seven of the patients with proven diarrhea were not screened for various reasons. Of special interest are four women who refused to participate in the study when they learned that their excretions would be examined for laxatives. Now, we could speculate all day long as to what would motivate a person to seek medical treatment for diarrhea and undergo expensive testing and diagnostic procedures such as barium swallows, upper GI studies, lower GI studies, expensive testing, expensive medical treatment. In fact, the patients with laxative abuse spent a total of 35 days in hospital and were seen on 29 occasions in the outpatient clinic after the laxative screening test was positive. So, so the doctors who provided treatment to these patients without knowing that these patients tested positive for laxatives worked the patients up for, uh, for a diagnostic workup and provided treatment all the while not knowing that these examinees had tested positive for laxatives. So, these patients underwent extensive treatment, and we could speculate all day as to why would they do that. Well, of concern to us here today is not why they would do that, but simply that they do do that for whatever reason, for whatever reason. And we're going to be encountering examinees with similar motives in our work as qualified medical evaluators, and it's critical that we provide the appropriate opinion either for or against industrial injury, whatever the case may be, without consideration as to why or what would motivate the examinee. Okay, so I think you get the point uh, with regards to the AMA guides, and maybe I'll just conclude with the final study from the AMA guides. This is a, a study entitled Chronic Pain and Litigation. What is the relationship? And I'll just simply give you the conclusion. The author Weintraub concluded that 20 to 46 percent of people, 20 to 46 percent, that's one in five or one in two, 46 percent is almost 50 percent, 50 percent is one in two. So either one in five to one in two of people consider purposeful misrepresentation of compensation claims to be acceptable behavior. <laughs> Can you believe that? Compensation claims would be personal injury claim, workers' compensation claim, 
disability compensation claim, Social Security, Veterans Administration, compensation claims, compensation claims. The author concludes that as many as every other person, as many as 50% of people consider purposeful misrepresentation, which is exaggeration or malingering, to be acceptable behavior. It's okay. <laughs> so without speculating as to why, we simply need to understand that it is, that it exists, that people do this. As many as 50% of people consider it to be, it's okay to purposely misrepresent on compensation claims. Is it possible that with the number of fraudulent claims going on, up to 30,000 lien cases per month, is it possible in California, which has the highest rates of permanent partial disability, the highest rates of workers' compensation premiums of the whole nation, the highest medical costs in the whole nation, is it possible that the number could be even higher? My suspicion is that it is, and therefore the AOE-COE determination is critical. Okay, so let's talk about how to do the AOE COE determination. Now, with regards to the AOE COE determination, we're going to be encountering examinees who uh, may not be uh, entirely forthcoming. They may be employing purposeful misrepresentation in their claim. So it's important to understand a couple of concepts regarding misrepresentations of claims. And I want to share with you a couple of ideas from this book, which is the Clinical Assessment of Malingering and Deception, third edition by Rogers. Fascinating book. I recommend uh, that uh, you get it and that you read it because it exactly describes situations that you've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. You're going to read this book and you're going to go, yep, that's happened. Yep, I've seen that scenario. Yes, I've seen that situation. Now, on, in this book, there's a chapter in here entitled Post-Traumatic Disorders, Malingering in Post-Traumatic Disorders. We see examinees who claim trauma, correct? They claim industrial injury. They claim trauma. And malingering is quite common uh, in post-traumatic disorders. So let's define a couple of terms uh, as we uh, bring today's discussion to a close. They talk about uh, three different types of malingering, pure malingering, partial malingering, and false imputation. And we've already touched on false imputation, and I want to spend some time talking about false imputation. So first of all, malingering is defined by the American Psychiatric Association as, quote, the intentional, it's intentional, the intentional production of false or grossly exaggerated physical or psychological symptoms motivated by external incentives. And we could uh, possibly speculate as to what some of those external incentives may be. And they tell us this external gain may take the form of financial rewards, such as temporary disability to the tune of $1.6 billion per year in California or permanent disability benefits to the tune of $1.4 billion per year. It may take the form of relief of responsibilities at a job or at home, avoiding military service or evading criminal responsibility. Malingering can be further categorized into number one, pure malingering, number two, partial malingering, and number three, false imputation. So let's just define these. When an individual feigns a disorder that does not exist at all, this is referred to as pure malingering. That's kind of rare, kind of rare in the work that we do. Most examinees have some sort of a condition, okay? When an individual has actual symptoms but consciously exaggerates them, it's called 
partial malingering. False imputation, on the other hand, now let's talk about false imputation. <clears throat> false imputation refers to the attribution, meaning they attribute their symptoms to a cause consciously recognized by the individual as having no relationship to the symptoms. So they attribute their symptoms to a false cause. They attribute actual symptoms to an industrial injury when it's not related to the industrial injury at all. So important components, their actual symptoms, actual condition. These examinees have an actual condition. They actually have pathology. So as a qualified medical evaluator, don't be surprised when you do a physical examination and you find pathology. They have an actual condition. Don't be confused by pathology. The question is not, does the examinee have pathology? The question is, is the pathology caused by the workplace activities? <laughs> and the examinee is there to attribute the cause of the condition to the workplace activities when the condition has no connection at all to the workplace activities. This is called false imputation. You're gonna encounter false imputation time and time and time again with examinees who have actual conditions and who are seeking workers' compensation benefits when the condition is not in any way related to the workplace activities. For example, for example, let's read from our notes. A male client seeking to be exempted from college math courses might attribute his problems with concentration to a learning disorder rather than to daily substance abuse. So this is an examinee who truly has problems with concentration and he has a motive. His motive is to get out of college math. And so he attributes his lack of concentration to a learning disorder when in fact the lack of concentration has a different cause. In this example, the cause is due to daily substance abuse. Another example, in a, a male claimant who is aware that he is suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder due to an earlier trauma may falsely ascribe the symptoms to a car accident in order to obtain monetary compensation. So the examinee truly has symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. On examination, the doctor will find this condition. It's an actual condition. The question is not, does the condition exist? In this examinee, they actually have the condition. But in this case, in order to gain financial compensation, the examinee ascribes or attributes the symptoms to a car accident, an actual car accident. <laughs> so they actually have a documented car accident to which they ascribe the symptoms when the symptoms are not in any way due to the car accident. They actually pre-existed the car accident. This is called false imputation. And we see these cases in workers' compensation all the time. An examinee who knows they have a problem with their back has a slip or a trip at work in order to falsely attribute the back pain symptoms to an incident that occurred at work. This is called false imputation. And we're gonna see these cases all the time. Now Rogers in his book tells us that false imputation is more difficult to identify than malingering because the individual can, from personal experience, accurately describe the symptoms and the impact of the symptoms on activities of daily living. So this is an examinee who's very credible. They're very credible. They're very accurate in their description of their symptoms. They're very accurate in their description of the impact of those symptoms on activities of daily living. And why are they accurate? They're accurate because they actually have the condition. It's an actual condition. In addition, some individuals fail to recognize that consecutive events do not necessarily have a causal relationship, and therefore they can ascribe symptoms that have no temporal relationship to, to any incident. So 
Uh, this is an examinee who, for example, will wash their car. This is describing consecutive events. Will wash their car, and then the next day it will rain, and they'll conclude that washing their car causes <laughs> causes rain. Okay, I know that's a silly example, but that's an example of consecutive events. And injured workers will say something like, uh, they had a slip at work and that slip caused them back pain when in actuality the slip did not in any way have anything to do with the back pain, but the slip and the back pain were simply consecutive events with no causal relationship. And can you see that the AOE COE determination in these cases is critical because we only want to provide benefits to injured workers who qualify and who deserve those benefits. And if the actual condition did not arise out of or occur in the course of employment, then the AOA COE determination needs to reflect that. Okay? Finally, uh, for psychology providers uh, and for physical providers as well, simply for your knowledge, False imputation often manifests as pretended depression, as post-traumatic stress disorder, or other anxiety disorders. All of these diagnoses are frequently the focus of disability claims, workers' compensation claims, or other civil litigation scenarios. Here, collateral information and detective work are essential. The above disorders are particularly vulnerable to malingering because of the importance of patient reported symptoms in the diagnosis. And isn't that how examinees present to us? They present to us reporting subjective symptoms. So you're going to see examinees uh, falsely imputing actual conditions to an industrial cause. Now, in our next session, we're gonna go through uh, an exact system that you can use in the face-to-face -face interview with the examinee and the interview process with your examinee to determine uh, the truth. Because examinees, and the RAND study tells us, examinees are going to be coming to us intentionally claiming workers' compensation injuries when no injury actually existed at all. And the RAND study tells us that there's as many as 30,000 of these claims, a pipeline of these claims occurring every month. Now, if we didn't know this, I wouldn't be sharing this information with you. I wouldn't have done this line of research. But according to the RAND study, there's a huge pipeline of fraudulent cases that are ending up in front of us for a qualified medical evaluation and our AOE COE determination is therefore critical. So in our next session, I'm gonna share with you an interviewing technique to quickly and accurately arrive at the truth and quickly and accurately arrive at the AOE COE determination that's correct 99% of the time. And we're gonna do that by focusing on the subtle nuances between the AOE determination and the COE determination and how it's the role of the qualified medical evaluator to focus, focus, focus on the AOE portion of the determination. A properly done AOE determination will be upheld by the trier of fact, the judge, 100% of the time, but it has to be done exactly perfectly. So doctors, I uh, hope this helps you. I know these are some sensitive topics and uh, these are uh, topics that no one seems willing to address. But that's my job, is to bring to you uh, the situations and circumstances that are occurring in the workers' compensation system in which we operate. And I know these are sensitive uh, topics for you, and you may have some difficulty uh, accepting this line of discussion, but I think it's important that we present all sides of the system. So... Uh, I hope this helps you and I hope you give this uh, topic uh, some good consideration as it relates to your very next evaluation. So uh, for today, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I wanna thank you for taking the time to join me on today's discussion. I look forward to being with you on our very next discussion as well. 
as we continue with our ongoing series entitled The QME's Financial Impact. And for now, I'm wishing you best of success in your career as a qualified medical evaluator.